Hi guys. It is a rainy day here in the end times in paradise in St. Croix, Virgin Islands. So I hope I have time for my Sunday morning doomsday sermon here on Sunday, February 14th, 2016. And uh, the, the problem, guys, is I'm starting to run out of books that I brought, of Bibles of the Apocalypse that I, uh, that I brought with me to the island. Uh, so I'm just going to be returning to the same books over and over because it appears that I'm going to be here longer than I thought. But fortunately, one of the Bibles of the Apocalypse I brought with me, and I've already had one, maybe even two rants from this book over the past several months, is a book of interviews uh, called Listening to the Land. Listening to the Land, and this is where my Humpty Dumpty tribe hero, Derek Jensen, uh, has interviewed a couple of dozen uh, various uh, lovers of the land and this week so what it is so in effect it's almost uh, let's call it two dozen Bibles of the Apocalypse and, and and he introduces Derek introduces us to all of these people from all sorts of uh, all spiritual paths and uh, scientific paths and whatnot but to in this chapter he interviews a fellow I have never heard of uh, a fellow named Reed Noss Reed Noss uh, the author of the book Saving Nature's Legacy Reed is the editor of the journal Conservation Biology so he is a trained scientist, a conservation biologist. And conserva this is this is Derek talking. Conservation biology has been called a combat discipline. Reed Noss writes uh, about it, quote, most biologists do not think of themselves as soldiers, but war has been declared against wild nature and we, best acquainted with that marvelous web of life, have no moral choice but to defend our wild friends and relatives, the innocent victims of human greed, ignorance, and arrogance. Our defense is not contingent on probabilities of winning or losing, it is an absolute obligation, close quote. Going back to Derek, Reed Noss has been fighting in defense of nature for more than 20 years. He specializes in applications of community and landscape ecology to conservation problems. Much of his work is concerned with the resolution of conflicts between commodity production and protection of biodiversity. He is the author of more than 100 papers and of the book Saving Nature's Legacy, as well as being the editor of Conservation Biology. So Derek starts off by asking Reed, why is biodiversity important? And Reed answers, <clears throat> if human beings have value in all ethical traditions except that we do, there is no objective reason to say that other species don't have intrinsic value. It has always seemed crazy to me that we can think of ourselves as fundamentally superior to other living things. <clears throat> we may be more intelligent than a peregrine falcon, 
but we sure can't fly as well. A falcon does just as well with its ability as we do with ours. Arguably, peregrine falcons do better because we are destroying everything while they are just living. I work for biodiversity to try to defend fellow creatures I believe have every right to exist. It is my obligation as a person and a scientist. <clears throat> so Derek asked him, how does your defense of wildlife mesh with what you've called our culture's mythology of purely objective, value-free science? Read Noss. Applied sciences are goal-oriented, and it's the same with conservation biology. We have a job to do, which is to improve the health of the environment to maintain or restore biodiversity. You still use the scientific process of testing hypotheses, but whenever there is any doubt about the right way to go, and there always is, you have the obligation, meaning as a scientist, to choose the action or strategy that minimizes risk to the species and ecosystem. And then Derek points out that some environmentalists are very critical of science. And I, and I have to admit, uh, occasionally your eco-Nazi, yours truly, agrees with this. This is uh, Reed's response. I don't have a lot of sympathy for science bashing because science is a perfectly appropriate way of solving problems. Ecological science, in particular, has done far more good than harm. People who are interested in protecting or restoring biodiversity ought to use any ethical means available to do that. What I am doing and what other conservation bio biologists with similar inclinations are doing is trying to save the earth. We are using a body of scientific knowledge and techniques to do that. It's not very different from a poet or an environmental activist except we are using different tools and techniques. It is also true that science is one of the best ways we have found to determine the nature of things. Other ways include meditation, spiritual approaches, and direct experience. Science is not complete, of course. It has to be complemented by an ethic. That is the major point. In an ethical vacuum, science is incredibly dangerous. <clears throat> it frustrates me that many of my fellow scientists, even the ones who have an appreciation of life for its own sake, and an inner feeling of biophilia do not want to admit these feelings. It somehow taints them, makes them appear unscientific. That is a very dualistic way of looking at life. We need to recognize that a person can love nature and study nature at the same time. And then I, of course, this next question by Derek has a special place in my little eco-Nazi heart. Assuming the human population continues to grow, 
at least for a while. What hope do you hold for the pres preservation of biodiversity? Uh, and, and this is the, the, the central crux of why I am hopeless for biodiversity, but this is not my rant or Derek Jensen's. This is Reed Noss's, the way he, in his life, is dealing with one of, if not the central contradictions of the 21st century. <clears throat> Reed Noss. Even with the projected population increases over the next 50 to 100 years, we can still do a hell of a job in protecting biodiversity by limiting our resource consumption, meaning there are still things we can do to the other head of the snake, overconsumption. Wood products make one good example. There was an internal forest service study of wood consumption that determined that if we, in the United States, recycled at the same rate as the Europeans, we would not have to cut one stick from our national forest. All of our public lands nationally contribute only 20% of our wood products and some analyses have shown that an aggressive wood product conservation and recycling program could cut our consumption by as much as 50 percent. Our whole public land system could then become reserves managed for biodiversity without any decline in our standard of living. So that is one, but unfortunately it's the only example at least that was left in this interview. So I don't know if he had a single other example about uh, that question because now it moves in to a forest service rant, a, a uh, U.S. forest service rant. Don't get me going on that one. Derek Askerid. <clears throat> If you were given the job of chief of the Forest Service tomorrow, what would you do? This is Reed's answer. I would tell Congress not to give us any money for road construction or timber sales. We would not do timber sales except for restoration forestry, that is, to thin stands that are overly dense because of fire suppression or plantations that are packed too tight. We do not need to do commercial forestry in our national forest. It is destructive. Instead, I would ask Congress for money for public works projects like road closures, revegetation of roads, fisheries restoration projects, thinning out plantations, helping plantations revert to more natural structures, that kind of thing. We could employ just as many people in the forest for the next several decades doing restoration work as we now do clear cutting. And it would give them something meaningful and positive to do with their lives. Okay, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Uh, this is Derek now pointing out that the concept, this whole concept of management of management uh, has very bad connotations for many environmentalists, yet you state very strongly the need for management. This is his comment on that. 
I continually argue with those environmentalists who want us to sit back and let nature heal on her own. And I just had a rant, leave it the hell alone. I think that would simply take too long. Furthermore, some sites would never heal. Protective and res restorative management is absolutely essential if we're going to maintain biodiversity. Then he goes into some examples about white-tailed deer management and fire suppression, uh, how we need to rethink all of, all of this. Uh, so, getting through all that, a lot of the restoration can be done using human labor to expedite the recovery process of, of, of these damaged, fragmented ecosystems. That's good because there is a spiritual benefit in restoration, going out and repairing something that your society has damaged. It is a form of retribution. We can adjust priorities as we go along, but the list of what we know needs to be done, closing roads, removing dams, and so forth, is long. And then they, they get off into talking about uh, legal ramifications of this. And so, for example, this is read, for example, the Forest Service might use biodiversity as an argument to cut down old growth forest and create a patchwork of young plantations. And uh, he talks about, you know, that unadulterated horseshit. <clears throat> Many species have done extraordinary well because of human activity. That's okay from the standpoint of those opportunistic species, but to argue that we should continue to favor those species at the expense of others going extinct is insane. The net result is impoverishment on a global scale. Next question from Derek. Do you think it is possible to manage a forest for resource extraction without killing it? The answer to that one, I don't know. There are, in the history of intensive forest management, very few success stories. Yes. I do think using wood is a legitimate activity. There's no reason why we should not use wood and other natural resources in moderation, but we need to reduce consumption and therefore practice much less intensive forestry. We need to tread lightly. Yes, and we can and must leave our natural forest alone, managing them only as necessary to substitute for missing natural processes. And what he's talking about here, so and this, as I say, I'm skipping over, he's continually pointing out when he's talking about forage, forest management, he's talking about managing forest that have already been destroyed by mismanagement and for those few remaining intact large tracts of forest in this country and on this planet, we absolutely must leave them alone. Which is what my rant about the New Guinea rainforest was about. Uh, a few days ago. So Derek now asks, 
what could we do to sustain a system over time? What does a sustainable culture look like? Reed answers, I don't think we know exactly. We are amazingly ignorant. We do know that our management goals have to change. The forests over much of the earth have gone from landscapes dominated by old forests to those dominated by young ones, from structurally rich stands to simplified stands, from large intact forest to smaller and more isolated forest. We've reduced fires and we've built roads. As a consequence of these and other trends, more and more species are threatened with extinction. We can maintain large reserves that are interconnected. We can use prescribed fire or allow natural fires to burn. We can close roads and we can recover populations of declining species. And then Derek uh, points out, I doubt the managers of the big timber corporations want to hear this. The cry of timber companies used to be, we need good science, and now the cry seems to be, and Reed taking over for Derek, shut up the scientists. They, meaning the big timber corporations, say that because science is not going the way they want it to. Each time a committee of scientists is called together to offer recommendations about a conservation problem, the scientists get a little stronger in what they say, and that is not what industry wants to hear. Okay, then he uh, pretty much fin finishes up we're talking about large undisturbed tracts of scientists okay Derek your last question that we're going to talk about in this rant many scientists like you are recommending the preservation or restoration of larger and larger chunks of intact wilderness why is size important take it away read to wrap up this sermon. <clears throat> if you only want to protect spotted owls or marbled murrelets or old growth trees, you might have very modest reserves of 20,000 acres provided you have enough of them. On the other hand, if you want to restore the full complexity of life in any region to maintain large carnivores or to restore large carnivores where they've been extirpated. In other words, to manage for a whole ecosystem rather than an impoverished ecosystem, you need a lot more area in much bigger networks. Big carnivores have large home ranges and they don't get along well with human activity, with at least the way humans tend to behave these days with their guns and off-road vehicles. If we want to maintain viable populations, we need millions of unfragmented areas not necessarily in one piece, but in a connected network inaccessible to motorized human activity. Here in Oregon's Coast Range, for example, we have lost the grizzly bear, the wolf, and it appears the wolverine and the Pacific fisher. If we want to restore these species, which I think we have an ethical obligation to do, we're going to have to maintain very large reserves, and they must be connected 
at a scale of millions of acres. And that brings me to the end of this week's Sunday Sermon. Hallelujah, brothers Reed and Derek. Listening to the land. And to close my sermon, I am listening to the clueless morons on their ORVs heading back to their cruise ship after destroying a pristine beach in paradise. I cannot think of a better a better backdrop to close out this week's Doomsday Sermon. Bye guys.